What a wonderful God we serve. What a great God we serve. And uh, looking unto him, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, how important it is for us to understand him and walk with him, love him, and enjoy all the good that he has for us. It's important that we know who we are in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we forget who we are in Christ Jesus. We always keep ourselves reminded of of what I am and how things are working in my life and what my past has been. But the primary importance is for us to know who we are in Christ Jesus. When you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you got to know that you are a new creation. All things have passed away, all things have become new in your life. You are no longer of the old. And you got to meditate on those things which are, which are in Christ Jesus. Because there is no need for us to try to understand and fathom what has happened in the past. We got to understand now that we are in Christ Jesus. Now we are new creations in Christ Jesus. Now we are a changed people. Now something good has happened in our lives. Let's go to the book of Philemon. The book of Philemon, just before the book of Hebrews, after the book of Titus, the book of Philemon, and uh, verse number six, verse number six, and that the communication of our of your faith may become effectual by acknowledging every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. That the fellowship or the communication of your faith may become, now that you have come to a communication or or fellowship with the Lord and the effect, that your faith may become effectual, your faith may become effectual. How do I get my faith effectual or powerfully working inside of me? Now we all know that we all have faith. Yeah, if you talk to people, oh yeah, I have faith. I have faith in Jesus. I have faith in the Lord. I have faith. But how do we make this faith effectual? How do we make this faith effectual? Working strong in our lives. See, faith is to understand that all things are working together for good in your life. Faith is to understand that it's a, it's, it's a powerful tool that is in me to overcome any given situation in life. There are many things that I over, there are many things that I see in life, but how do I make my faith effectual? And then it says, how, how I make it effectual? By acknowledging. And the nearest word to acknowledge is to confess, is to keep saying every good, you don't have any bad things, every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. You already have it inside of you. Deliverance is inside of you. Your miracle is inside of you. Your healing is inside of you. Your prosperity is inside of you. Your, your joy is inside Your peace, everything is inside of us. Why do we seek for anything from out? Why do we try to seek anything from out when everything is already given to us? It's inside of us that the communication of your faith may become effectual. Faith is the victory that we have. It's by faith that we overcome demons. It's by faith we overcome uh, the defeated situations that we see in the natural. See, as long as you walk in the natural, you see with your, your five senses, you, you move with your five senses and you move by your emotions. You know, we can be so, emotions are good, but don't let it just override your faith that is in you. You got to have, you know, people get so emotional, they get so easily offended, they get so easily caught up, they, and they, they, they feel that emotions, they make emotions their God. Well, I, this is what I think. I think she thinks bad about me. I think he thinks bad about me. I think, I think, but your emotions are leading you astray. Your emotions are killing your faith. 
There, there, there is a place for your emotions. There's a place we don't doubt it. We are, we are people, we are humans, we have emotions, but don't let your emotions go against your conscience. And your conscience is the spirit person who is inside of you. Don't go against. You can be emotional, you may have your emotions. Each person is different, okay? We may have different emotions. That's how we have been, that's how we have built ourselves up or that's in us sometimes. But that is not the final, your emotions ought not to be your final factor of making decisions. You can be emotional today and your emotions can be gone tomorrow. All of a sudden, the next moment you are not emotional, the next moment you are a bit serious. And then the next moment you get emotional again and then... And you cannot win a battle by being emotional. People lose every faith battle by being emotional. Every faith battle is lost by being emotional. Right? So you've got to let your emotions rise up, it's okay, it's okay to have emotions. Somebody might have more emotions than the other, but that is not the final, that's not the, that's not the discerning factor of things in life. Your faith has to become effectual. Your faith has to become effectual by acknowledging or confessing every good thing which is in you. It's already in, it's not outside, it's not somewhere down up, up there. Oh, I'm waiting for my healing, I'm waiting for my, my, my pros. I'm waiting for something good to happen. It's already inside of you. Every battle we lose because we always think it has to come from an external force. We wait for something to happen from outside. I'm just waiting. I'm, for, I'm just waiting for something good to happen from outside. I'm just waiting. Your waiting period can even lapse, but you still feel because your, your emotions have, have taken place of the faith that is in you. I can be in the Lord for five years, six years, 10 years, 20 years, but if I've never learned the secret of using my faith effectually by acknowledging every good thing that I have, by agreeing with God's word and say, I agree with God's word. I don't, have, I don't believe my emotions. I can be emotional because somebody told me something. I can get hurt today and the next moment, either I can choose to live in that hurt or I can choose to resist it and say, no, I'm not going to carry that forward. I choose to let my faith effectually work. I want my faith. I don't want any kind of a barrier. I don't want a hindrance for my faith to be blocked. Your emotions can be a big faith block. There are many blockers. I mean, your limitation. You think, oh, I think God can do something, but they're not, not this thing. The children of Israel, the Bible says, they limited the Holy One. Let me come back to this scripture. Let me show you a scripture from the book of Psalm 100. And seven. Uh, Psalm 100 and, no, 100 and, okay, it's, it's somewhere down there, Psalm 104 or 5 or 6, where it says, they limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Hmm? 70, oh, okay, right. 78, 40, huh? 41. 78, 41, okay. You got the scripture, okay? That's how easy it is when you have a concordance in your phone. You know, you, you can get your scriptures fast. You know, everything, we got to use everything. Technology should be easy for us. We should use it for the, for the best purpose. Use it for the concordance is for our benefit. Right. We know that there's a scripture, but then where, it, where is it? Right. Scriptures are important because it gives us wisdom, understanding, it gives us instructions, it rebukes us, it corrects us. Scriptures are important. Verse number 41 says, Yea, they turned their back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. How much have you limited God in your life? 
limitations can come into a person's life by our emotions. It also can come, I strongly believe, I mean, you get into a routine of living instead of living in the freshness and the newness of life. You know, the Bible talks about living in the newness of life. Newness of the spirit. Living in the newness of the spirit. Romans chapter 7 and verse uh, 4 or 5 there. It says you ought to be living in the newness of the spirit. Not of the oldness of the letter. Right? Verse number 4. 4 or 6. Romans chapter 7 and verse number 6. 6. Okay. But now we are delivered from the law. You don't have a set of rules that you live by being afraid of. I wonder if I miss the mark. But you have the spirit of God inside of you who leads you and guides you. That being dead therein, we were held by the law. That we should serve in the newness of the spirit, the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. He leads us and he wants us to serve him in the newness of the spirit. Now, when we get into a routine kind of living, tolerance, kind of, you know, okay, it's all right. I mean, I'll just get along. I'll just get, you start to limit God. Little by little, you start limiting God. At one time, you thought sky was the limit, but now you begin to see, oh my God, I just cannot go. I find it difficult to understand God. I, I don't think God can do this. God can move in this situation. My daily routine has been, has put me into a bondage. We should always serve the Lord in the newness of the spirit or the freshness of the spirit. You may have a word today from the Lord. Right now you have a word from the Lord and you've got to act according to how he gives you the word. So we, we don't, and if you start living by the oldness of the letter, which is the routine kind, okay, I just know that we, it should happen sometime, and, I, I, and that's how most of the Pentecostal churches have become. And they have kind of, you know, lived in the oldness of the letter, a kind of daily routine, so limited in understanding God. But God wants us to live in the newness of the spirit so that there is no limitation. We, don't, we are not moved by our, our emotions don't take preeminence in our lives. But we are living in the newness of the spirit. The Holy Ghost is leading me. The Holy Ghost is showing me. He can speak to you through dreams, through visions, through strong impressions. I have I spoken to some very new converts and, and they come and tell me the Lord spoke to me. I said, good. I get excited. And, and sometimes the older folk would think, oh yeah, those are just emotional moves. When I had a vision from the Lord in my early day, I mean, I was drunk when I went to church and I had, emo- I, I had, a, I had an encounter with the Lord. And some of the elders at that time, they said, yeah, those are simple things. But even today, the Lord keeps reminding me. And I keep talking to people about what the Lord, how the Lord appeared to me and how, how, how I was, I came into an encounter with the Lord. And, and you, f- you, f- you forget the newness and you get into the oldness of the letter. Oh, I believe the Bible. And they would just pick up scriptures from here and there that would just, you know, line up with the kind of living that they are, that the lifestyle that they're living now. Oh, yeah, God gives and God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, God, you know, he tests, he brings sickness into our bodies to test us, you see. That's oldness of the letter. Trying to live. Instead of saying, Lord, you're a good God. You move in the spirit, the newness of the spirit. There's there's always a refreshing in the presence of the Lord. There's always... A refreshing. The Bible says your, your, heart, your heart is, your, your spirit right, right down inside of you is not a, a little lake or a pond. It's a river. You shall flow out in the, as a river. You're, you're moving in as a river. 
So I, I live in the newness of the spirit. And his words, are, his words are so comforting and so good. You can always be assured in any circumstance, you're always the head. In any situation, you're always on top. In any surrounding that you live in, you always live and you don't die. And you shall say, I shall declare the works of God. I'm not willing to die. It's too early for me to get into the grave. I don't want to live. You know the word die in the Old Testament or in, in the, when God spoke to uh, Adam and Eve and said, the day that you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. That word die means in dying, you shall keep dying. It's not a graveyard death matter. It's that you're going to live such a defeated life that you're going to die and die on a continual basis. You'll never have any victories in your life. The word death, when we hear the word death, we always think of funeral and we think of the casket and all kinds of things, but that's not what it means. It means you live a defeated life. You live a life where, where there is no freshness at all. But God has called you to live in the newness of life, in the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit, because he's inside of you. He's inside of you. So don't ever limit God. Don't ever limit God. God can save the worst of the person that you ever thought who would ever get saved. I would never think that he could get saved or she could get saved. In fact, Jesus spoke it like this. I like the words he said. After he saw a Roman centurion whom, uh, a Roman centurion in the book of chapter, the Matthew chapter 8 in Matthew chapter 8, we find how the Roman centurion, he approached Jesus. See, it, it, it does matter how you approach Christ, how you approach Jesus. You know, we always say, oh, if God wants to, he can do it. Yeah, he can if he wants to, but he doesn't do it. He'll never do anything without your permission. See, why didn't God all this time do anything for me? Why hasn't the Lord done? But God says, if you don't approach, if you don't come on my terms and conditions, how can I work in your life? Maybe once in a while we may have a miracle, but that's a life of a believer is not supposed to be based on a miracle or running for a deliverance service and say, I want to go for a deliverance ministry. I, I want to feel delivered. You might feel delivered, but you're not delivered because it's only the truth that delivers a person. It's not your feelings that has delivered you. It's truth that delivers a person. It's truth that delivers a person. Right? So the centurion, the Jews were under the Romans at this time. And then, but this centurion, he, he, he was effectual in the belief that he had, in the faith that he had. And he put, the, he put his faith to work. Like Brother Howard says, give your faith a job to do and he will do it for you. So, when he saw faith in Matthew chapter 10 and 8 and verse number 10, when Jesus heard, he marveled and said unto them that followed. Now here we find the centurion has declared his faith and he said, Master, speak a word only, and my servant will be healed. And Jesus counted that as a very valuable word. He said, he, he marveled, he was, he said, verily I say unto you, I have not found, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. This man, who was a Roman centurion, he was a different character. He put his faith to work. Although, whatever belief he had, he, he, one thing he knew, that if you put your faith to work, you get results. If you put your faith to work, but if you keep murmuring and complaining, oh, my servant is, oh, I don't know what's going to happen to my servant. I, you know, we, most of the time, we are so used to looking at the problem and talking about the problem. We, people get, people are, 
they just love to talk about their problems to everybody. Let me tell you what, what I'm going through really. You see, you should understand what I'm really going through. I'm really having this issue. Now, I can understand if you go, if you talk to somebody who is very near, who is going to help you out and then who would give some advice. But if you take the advice and you don't use that advice, what are the big, what are the big idea? God works by principle. He doesn't change from person to person. Okay, since you're a grumbler, I'll work with you in a different way. Grumblers and murmurers and complainers, they would always be stung by the enemy. They have more demon problems. Murmurers, complainers, grumblers, they have more problems. Just like I heard a preacher, he says, I have seen murmurers, complainers, fault finders, they will always have something to complain about. They're going down the tubes. But I find somebody who was in an adulterous situation and he has put his life right, he's shooting high up. But that murmurer and that complainer is always in the same place. He always keeps complaining. But here this adulterer, he put, in, put himself right. He went before the Lord and he wept and said, Lord, forgive me. Lord, I know it's, 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 it's a sin, Lord. It's, it's one of the worst sins that I've committed. I've sinned against my, my wife and I've sinned against you, Lord. Forgive me. And that man, he can shoot up high because he knows how to be grateful to the Lord. Imagine David. He was never a complainer, but he had a bad habit of at this time he, he, he went before he, he, he committed adultery he lied but God looks at him and because the very first thing when the prophet came and pointed out his mistake he didn't try to give an excuse and say oh yeah but that woman she should have not had a bath right under my nose she should have had she should have had more courtesy in finding her I mean there are ethics I mean if you're, if you're living around the palace you should be he didn't. When the prophet came and put his finger on his nose and he said, you have committed adultery, he just fell flat on the ground and he said, God have mercy on me. Forgive me, Lord. And Psalm 51, he just goes before, he just breaks down and he said, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. It's me, Lord. It's me. It's, I'm the problem. Please don't take away that life out of me. And God still calls him a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he repented. He repented. But that complainer and that murmurer and the one who always finds fault is going down and down. Because he or she has every, I mean she or he feels that she or he has every right to find fault. So you keep finding fault you keep finding fault, you keep complaining and you keep murmuring and you speak, go against authority. See, God has, God has placed authority. Everything, everything works with authority. Let me just show you that scripture and come back to this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10. See, if you go against the authority, you're calling for trouble. You're calling for trouble. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You see, when we, when we don't stay under authority and start working according to authority, because the centurion, he worked in authority. He said, I have, I'm, in, I'm in control of my life. I have those who are above me and I have those who are under me. And I know how authority works. How authority works. I'm subject to my commander. And since I'm a centurion, I have people under me. And when I say something, it's done. It's done. So when you tamper with God's authority, you're only inviting demons to handle your affairs. Okay, let me take you to that scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm sorry, chapter 11, not 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 1 onwards. Be followers of me even as I also am a follower of Christ. Now, Paul, he's saying, since he has birthed this church, 
through the word and the spirit, he says, follow me. Even as I follow you, as long as I follow Christ, follow me because I have something that I can give you. I have something that, I, I, I'm a leader, I can help you, fo- follow me. And verse 11 says, verse two, I'm sorry, verse two. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. The next verse. But I would, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every man is Christ. Now there is authority here. The head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is the man. That's walking in authority. And the head of Christ is God. See, when you, when you tamper with God's plan, you're calling for destruction in the home, in your surrounding, wherever you are. You can try everything that you can and try to tamper with the, with, with the plan of God and the ordinances of God. You can never, ever win that battle. So when you play around with these things, eventually we find that the demons, they have authority. They say, okay, since you're walking in rebellion, the word rebellion simply means you don't submit to authority. The word rebellion simply means you don't submit to authority. So since you are, you're, you're going against the authority, a God-ordained authority, I have a right to come and trouble you. That's how many people are troubled. Many people are finding it difficult to sort matters out because they have never understood what it means to submit to authority. Going back again to the, to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew. The centurion, he understood what authority is and how faith works through authority. And, uh, and his declaration was, in chapter 8 and verse number 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou should come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant will be healed. Speak the word only. See, it's very easy to get stuff done in your life. Speak the word only. Speak the word only. Nothing else. Speak the word only. Instead of complaining and murmuring and and trying to justify your situation and trying to say who is right and who is wrong, speak the word only. The centurion answered and said, Lord, speak the word only and my servant will be healed. My situation will normalize. My sickness will be healed. I can be delivered if you only speak the word. They're trying to get people to speak the word, but people still want to complain about their problems. They love to complain, thinking that the complaints would always bring the solution to them. Complaints don't bring any solution to them. But that's the easiest way to move in your emotions and try to win the the heart of another person and let somebody else feel sorry for you. Oh Lord, do something Lord. You know, we, we want people to feel sorry for us, but God has a principle how it works. God says, speak the word only. Speak the word only and your situation shall be normalized. Your situation shall come back in place. Your sickness is going to be gone. Your problem in the home will be gone. Your your, your things that you have been having, speak the word only. Speak the word only. And Jesus marveled him being a centurion. How come he understood this? Why? Because he understood what authority is. Right? He understood what authority is. And the next verse says, for I am a man under authority. See, if you you submit to the right authority, for you to speak the word won't be a difficult thing. Right? I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this and it is done. Or he does. I mean, that's authority. That's how it works. That's God's way. If you want to speak the word with no authority, God says it won't work. 
it won't work. It's impossible for things to work with no authority. If children are not going to submit to their parents as long as their children are under their roof, they don't make the decisions. The parents make the decision. It comes on the head, the father, the mother, and they both unite themselves and say, this is how it's going to be if it is under this roof. And children have no right over the parents and say, you better do it this way. That's not how it works. That faith, faith never works that way. Faith never works that way. And then we find children become rebellious and we find, find it so difficult to handle the situation and it's all a tantrum. That's all that's happening around. And we want to just get things sorted out but there is no authority in the home. The husband submits to Christ and the woman submits to the man and then they walk in harmony and then get their children to obey them. The husband and wife, they are, they are, they are co-together. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives. And, the, and, and, and in return, the wives submit to your husband or respect your husbands because that's how God made it. It doesn't matter whether the, whether the lady is more educated than you are or she's more intelligent than you are or she, whether she earns more than you. It simply means there is authority, spiritual authority that Christ has placed in the home, in the church, in the body of fellowship, amongst each other. So we submit to authority. How will my faith work if I'm not in authority? I'm not submitting to authority. And the next word that he used, children, obey your parents. That word submission and obedience are two different words. The wife submits to the husband, which means it's, it's a voluntary submission, as the scriptures say. But children must obey their parents. That's how it goes. It didn't say obey your father, obey your mother. It says obey your parents, which means that when the parents are in, in unity and harmony, the child has to obey. No matter how much a tantrum goes around, no matter how things are, still we want to bring the children up in the right way. We've got to teach them authority. If they have to walk by faith and to do things by faith, it does matter that you speak out and speak the truth. So this man, being a centurion, he said, I'm a man under, under authority. Number one, he said, I'm a man under authority. Having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come. Authority. He comes with all this, and Jesus marvels. How come you know so much about authority and faith? How does faith and authority, you couple both together and put things in order? Jesus was surprised. And we sometimes still try to find and understand, oh, how could, I, how could this have anything to do with my submission or with, with authority or faith? How can this happen? Verse number 10, Jesus heard it and marveled. He said, wow, I'm so surprised to hear this. How come you had so much of wisdom putting faith together with authority? And he said unto them, all right, and he said unto them that followed. Uh, so he's, he took this example and he, and, and he spoke to his followers. And he's speaking to us who are his followers. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Israelites were supposed to have faith. But he said, I could not find this faith. I could not find this faith in Israel. And then he goes on down to say, I say unto you that many shall come from the east and from the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, these are, these are people of faith in the kingdom. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out and there shall be weeping and gnashing. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go your way. As thou hast believed, so be it done unto you. And his servant was healed in the very same hour. Do you want some miracles to happen in your life? When you want miracles to happen in your life, when you want some, your faith to be activated and your faith to work in your life, 
then do it the way that God wants done. And you have everything through in your life. You get everything through in your life. It's not going to be difficult. You're not going to find it difficult to get things sorted out in your life. And the very hour, you're going to have some answers coming into your life. Stand your ground and use your authority and say, in the name of Jesus, devil, you have no right over my life. Stand your ground and, and submit to authority and say, yes, Lord, I'm, going to, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to follow. Paul, he didn't write this just to be writing this. He wrote this, he said, be ye followers of me even as I'm a follower of Christ. He said, I am submitting myself to Christ and I'm giving you the knowledge which Christ has imparted to me that I would share it with you. And as long as I'm living according to this knowledge, follow me. And then he continues and he says, this is the ordinance, keep these ordinances so that you will see things coming right in your life. So, faith and authority, how they work, they, they don't work uh, separately. When I have the authority, when I, when I use the authority rightly, my faith easily works. I get, my, I get my prayers answered easier. I get things sorted out easier in my life. So if you're somebody who says, well, I don't know, I've, ne I've, never, I've, never, I've never learned what submission means. I never learned what it means to submit to authority. But you can learn. Number one, your, your submission to the authority should be the word of God. Your submission to, the, to God's word, that's the final authority in your life. Your submission to the word of God, your submission to Christ who is the head of the church. He is the head of the church and we are the body in particular. We are different members, right? He is there, so we submit to him through which we can use our authority against demon powers. Demons are all around. Demons are not hanging around in nightclubs. Demons are hanging around in, in our homes because that's the place that he wants to bring destruction upon. Demons, they had any, I mean, they would have hung around anywhere. Why did they hang around, in, around Adam and Eve? How, why, did, why was demons so interested in Adam and Eve? Why was Satan so in, interested in Eve? By controlling her mind, by, 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 by making her to do something that was contrary to God's will. She even brought the man under submission and ruined the entire human race. Satan is after those who are loved of God. That's the reason you, you'll enjoy life better if you understand the scriptures better and walk according to the scriptures, it wouldn't be difficult. So understanding that you're a new creation, when you understand that you're a new creation, you walk in the newness of life, that all things have passed away in your life and all things have become new in your life. You live differently. You, you use your, you, you live with authority. You live in authority. You don't, you, don't, you don't lose authority just because you came to Christ. Now you are walking in the fullest authority in Christ. So going back to the book of Philemon, the book of Philemon. So before that we go to, we go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll read from verse number 15 onwards. He died for all, and he died for all, the day which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. He died for us, for all. Now we don't live for ourselves. See, when you're, when you're selfish, when you use selfishness, then you, do, you live for yourself. You find it difficult to use that authority as a new person. You don't live just for yourself. You live for him. But they, which should, they should live not for themselves. Henceforth, live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and who rose again. Let's understand this right. The life which I got now is a new life. My life is not mine no more. His spirit came into my spirit and joined with my spirit. 
And that's why my spirit is always right. My emotions are wrong. My flesh is wrong. My mind is wrong. But your spirit is always right. You will always have a word in your spirit. Know what you're doing is wrong. Because his spirit and your spirit have got in together and they are one. He can never make a mistake. Right? Your spirit is alive now. So, when you, when you pray in the spirit, you're praying right from within you. You don't, if, you, you don't you, when you don't feel like praying also, you still pray because it's not your feelings that's praying, it's your spirit that is praying. I don't feel like praying. I feel bored reading the Bible. I feel all that. Well, I think we should stop saying such things and start saying, yes, Lord, I'm going to believe what you say in your word. I'm going to read the word. I'm going to, I'm going to study the word. I'm going to declare the word. So you don't live for yourself, you live for him. Verse 16 says, henceforth, no, we no man after the flesh. Henceforth, no, we no man after the flesh. Don't know people according to their flesh. And people remind you of your past. You said, who are you talking about? That man died. When you got water baptism, all your old sins were buried together with your old nature. So when people come around and tell you about your past, you say, I don't know about that person. You see, people who try to win arguments, they always talk about the past. That's the only way they can win an argument. You've been doing this for the last 15 times and you're doing the same thing again. Why? But they still know you in the flesh. You've been repeating the same thing over and over again. You'll never, you'll never come right. You'll always be the same. That's how they threaten you. That's how they put fear on you. Paralyze your faith. Henceforth, we know no man after the flesh. You got to know no man after the flesh. So if you have a company of people who are all the time reminding you of your past, get out of that company. Get out of that company. If they really want to talk about your past. Because that's not walking in the newness of life. That is getting, you're getting into this routine kind where you will start limiting God. Your life is going to be limited all the time. Get out of the people who are, who are always talking about your past. All your past failures. Get out. Well, if you're, if you're, in a, if you're in this, under this, in the same roof, you can't get out of the same roof. You've got to bear it. You've got to love that person. It could be your husband who reminds you of your past. It could be a wife who reminds you of your past. You've got to love them. But I'm talking about a, a, a group of people outside your home. See, your, your family is very precious. The Bible says God honors he respects families. He respects families. In Psalm 68 and verse, I believe in verse 6 it says, the rebellious, they always dwell in the right place, but then God wants people to dwell in families. God respects families. And also in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 4 it says, God honors families. He honors marriage. That's God's Marriage is honorable in all. That's what it says. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all. And the bed undefiled. But homongers and adulterers, God will judge. So marriage is an honorable thing. God made Adam and Eve. God didn't make Adam and Adam. Or Steve and Steve. Or, or a woman with a woman. Or man. It, does, it doesn't fix right. How much ever our modern generation say, it's all right, I mean, after all, you can live with a man if you're a man. That's going to happen around because that's, that's, that's how people think is right. But God dishonors such things, but he honors marriage. Man and a woman. That's how God sees. And the bed undefiled, which means he, he, he disrespects people who have no regard at all. Uh, concerning their intimate relationships. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't honor them. He says, well, that's wrong. If you're married, you're married. Her body does not belong to you and, uh, and the husband's body does not belong to himself. And the wife's body does not belong to herself. It belongs to each other. 
So that's a subject altogether different, but then still for all, we find you got to get out of the company of people who always brag about your past, your fleshly deeds. So when it comes to a family, you got to walk in patience, walk in love, but resist. No, this is the first time I made the mistake. I may have done this 15 times prior to it. This could be the 16th time that I'm doing it, but God forgives me. And why don't you forgive me? When Peter asked, how many times should we forgive a brother who has committed a sin against us? And Jesus said, uh, and he said, it is seven times for a day. Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. It's 490 times a day. If you find a person who makes a mistake against you and he said, I repent, you forgive that person. That's a lot of times. Taking off the couple of hours that you go to sleep. I mean, that's about every two minutes, somebody calculated and said, every two minutes this guy makes a mistake and you're supposed to forgive him. That's how you walk in the newness of life. That's the life that we have in Christ Jesus. So that's how we, we mature in Christ and start doing things rightly and, and live the different kind of life. No longer living in the oldness of the letter but living in the newness of, uh, uh, of the spirit. Going back again to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 15, uh, verse 16. Wherefore henceforth Therefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we, were, we, were, we have known Christ after the flesh, yet henceforth know we him no more in the flesh. Oh, I wish I could see Jesus. You want to touch Jesus. Jesus said, by touching me, nothing happens. I wish if I, wish if I was one of the disciples of Jesus. Who do you think you are? You are one of the disciples of Jesus. Oh, I wish I was in the times when Jesus was. Well, Jesus is still alive. But he, does, he cannot trust us with visions and he cannot trust us with any, anything fleshly because we would. I remember long years back, I, I was preaching in a particular place and, 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 and when I came out of the meeting, he's, this guy came running after me. So, you're talking about Jesus. Shall we make a, a, a picture of Jesus here? Shall we... In, uh, in this junction, I'm a very influential man in this, uh, in this scheme. Shall we make a, a statue of Jesus here? I said, I didn't talk about statues, man. The people are so weak in their minds, they would just run in for anything. But they don't want to believe Jesus is in the spirit. How much do you believe your breath? Can I ask you? Every split second, you're believing that you're going to breathe. Every split second. Why wouldn't you believe that the Holy Spirit is just like that? He's in the spirit. He's a spirit. I mean, I don't say, I don't breathe once and say, oh, I'm just believing for the next breath. I wish I, I wonder if I would have the next breath coming into me. Ah, yeah, I feel good. I don't know whether I'll have the next breath. You don't. You don't. You just walk. You don't even remember that you're breathing. Likewise, we walk in him. We live in him, the Bible says. We're living inside of him. Let me show you that scripture. We get so absence of God and we are so present with what we see in the natural. In the book of Acts, chapter number 17. In the book of Acts, chapter number 17. Oh, there are lots of verses there, but I'll just try to see whether I could we'll just read this. Okay, just for time's sake, we'll read one scripture. Verse number 28. For in him we live, and we move, and have our being. In him we live, and have... I put the wrong scripture, 28. 28. In him we live and move and have our being. We are living in him. And we are moving in him 
and we are having our being in him. We are in him. How, 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 how should it be so difficult for us to believe that God is a spirit and they who worship in spirit and truth that he is well pleased with, that he's seeking for true worshipers who worship him in spirit and truth. So whenever you think of doubting or limiting God, you think of holding your breath for a moment and saying, I'm going to be conscious about my breath now. I'm going to breathe once and I'm going to imagine I wonder if I'm going to get the next breath. You just simply need to know I'm walking in God. And moreover, we have another scripture which tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it goes like this. In verse number 16, on what, con- what agreement had the temple of God, you are the temple of God, with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. For God has said, I will dwell in them, walk in them, I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. God says, you are my temple now. You are my, I'm walking in you. Can you imagine God walking in us, inside of us? Oh, I've never read the scriptures. I don't go into deep. There's nothing deep at all. It's very simple. He says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God said, I dwell in them. He dwells in us and is walking in us. And he'll be, he'll be a, he's our God and we are his people. God is walking in us. Can you imagine? That's how close we are. That's how close we are. I said, we need to believe God. You are true. And you are so good to, I mean, it's great to know you. Quickly, we'll close the two scriptures in 2 Corinthians again in chapter number 5 and verse 16. We read verse 16, no, no be no man after the flesh. Verse 17, we go to 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You're in Christ, you're a new creation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, new creature. If you're a new creature, that word new means you're a new species of being that never existed before. That word new simply does not, I mean, we just see our birthmarks and we think, oh, we're just the same old person. I mean, we got ourselves baptized. But he's talking about the inner man which never, ever lived, a new species. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Your defeat is gone. Your your, your kind of living is gone of the past. Behold, look, all things are become new. Everything in you is new. New, never had anything to do with your past. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're a new personality. You are new. Don't, when people bring up your past and talk about your flesh, they're talking about your, 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 your flesh, your, your, your natural person. Every now and then you may, make a, you may stumble and, and try to live like the old person or try to have, but that does not make you the old person. You are not the old person. If, you, if, if you're moving in your emotions, you're going to walk like the old person. But if you start living by faith, you walk in the newness of life. You're not walking in the oldness of the letter. You're walking in the newness of life. And we are going to close with the scripture that we, that we started off. Philemon chapter, there's only one chapter there in verse number six. That the communication or the fellowship of your faith You've been, you're, 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 you have come into a relationship with Christ. That's your communication with Christ. Your faith may become effectual because I don't want to have a dead faith in me that lies dormant in me, that has no ability of moving in my life and causing miracles and blessings to come into my life. I just say that I have faith, but I don't, I don't really have. I'm not really effectual in the faith that I'm having. So if you want your faith to be effectual, 
then acknowledge or confess every good thing which is in you. Every good thing is not coming from heaven, it's already inside of you. Because when Jesus came into your life, he came entirely with all the good, the healing, the prosperity, the joy, the peace, the comfort, everything good inside of you, which is in you in Christ Jesus. That's how you make your faith effectual. Instead of complaining and murmuring and grumbling and, and you don't want to live with such a person. You wouldn't want to get close to a person who only has to complain. You know, dangers, danger, the danger of complaining is you will be stung by the enemy. Let me show you that scripture because it's dangerous. It's too dangerous for you to complain. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 10. Neither murmur ye or be a complainer, murmurer, fault finder. As some of them also murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer. I don't want to be destroyed by the destroyer. I don't want him to touch me. I don't want to complain. I want to walk in authority and faith and overcome. And my authority works when I know whom I'm submitted to. I cannot walk in my own self-made authority. I have to walk in the authority that Christ has delivered to me. So I don't want to complain and murmur as some of them also murmured and they were, con- they were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these, verse 11 says, now all these things happen unto them for our examples. All things that happen to them. So when you read these stories of the past in the, in the Old Testament, all those are examples for us. Take them as examples. So Lord, I thank you for that. At least I have things that are recorded of what they did as an example. I don't want to complain. I don't want to murmur. I don't want to, if I want to, if anything was, has to come out of my mouth, it has to be the oracles of God. I believe it's in, it says, if you want to speak something, speak the word of God. First Peter chapter four, oracles of God. If you have to speak, you speak the oracles of God. Can you put that scripture up? First Peter chapter three or chapter four, I believe. In. And verse number, f- it says, First Peter chapter three, First Peter chapter three. Got the scripture here, you got it? If you really have to speak something, speak the word of God. If any man speak, let him speak the oracles of God. I mean, some people love to speak. Good. But speak the oracles of God. Speak the word of God. I love to speak, honestly. But if I sit with people, I want to speak the word. And if I feel that I'm going into anything apart from the word, I, I, feel, that I, I feel, okay, I'm sorry, Lord. I think, you said speak the oracles of God. Oh, you mean to say we don't have any other chats that we can do? It's all right, you can just casually have your chat, but make sure that nothing goes against the oracles of God. Speak the word only and my servant will be healed. Speak the word only, and my body will be healed. Speak the word only, and my family will come in line. Speak the word only, and I'll get things in order in my life. Speak the word only, and I get, my, get, get everything that I need to happen in my life. Heavenly Father, we pray, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, for we are in Christ Jesus, and all the good that you have for us is in us, inside of us, and we receive everything with thanksgiving into our lives. We give you the praise, the honor, the due, uh, due, holy, uh, uh, due glory unto your holy name. We believe that your good and your mercies endure forever. I thank you for each and every person in this place as these words have gone forth out of God. And I pray, Lord, that these words will bring joy and happiness into the hearts and lives of the people to make the right decision in life not to let their emotions make the decision, but let faith and authority make the right decision in their life. Help them, Lord. Help each and every one of us to make the right choice in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.